What nice people. Ah, my office. The perfect office. Perspex desk, no in tray, no out tray, no phone, no filing cabinets, no clutter. Quiet, cool, very efficient. I need never get out of this chair. That'll be nice. No distractions. Just me and the work. Alone and efficient. Alone. Wonder if anybody wants me. Nobody to ask. Messages. Well, BJ39 will know. After all, it works for me. I don't even have to go to it. Much better than a human being. Tireless and efficient. Anything I want, it brings. Even company. I'm just off to New York. Before I go, don't get charged. Fine. Well, recorded company anyway. Charlie. Of course, I could have taken it round to Charlie's office myself. But, well, then. The photograph's just as good. Anyway, old BJ will take it to him. Several copies. I wonder if it ever bumps into anything. <laughs> Certainly free to get a lot of work done with no human distractions. Just me and my executive prism. It relaxes me. It relaxes me. It relaxes me. Ah, oh, well. Letter. Funny how fast you get down to work when you're alone. I mean, really alone. Uh, take a letter, Miss Smith, to Mr. Charles Durrant. Uh, dear Durrant, dear Miss uh, Smith, me. wherever you are, you always were late, inefficient, talkative. <laughs> I must have threatened to fire you a dozen times. No more of that nonsense now. I'm an automated executive. Even the coffee's automatic. Go away. See, it goes away. Quietly, efficiently. The great thing about machines is that they do what they're told. They leave you to get on with it. Never late, they're obedient, they're never sick, they never disturb you, or argue, or paint their nails, or talk, or smile at you or say good morning, or keep you company. They just leave you alone. They leave you alone. Preparing Nelly to do a day's work has become a well-practiced routine. OK, please, where the keys are in. Right, keys in. Can you check this oil level, please, Harry? Oil OK. Right, can you check this temperatures, please, Malcolm? OK, disc up to speed. Hello, alternator house. Disc oil and temperature OK. Is it OK your end? Motor, indicator on. OK for standby. Switch on standby, Peter. Coming on. Okay, HD coming on. The computer is ready for use. At this school, they learn to use it early. In the first form, they're taught how it works by playing at being a computer. A raised arm denotes an electrical signal, a lowered arm denotes its absence. In this way, they can simulate the two number language of computers. Now we're going to add two numbers together in exactly the same way as a computer does. Register A holding the binary equivalent of 38. Register B holding the binary equivalent of 23. Ready for the clock? The clock, the banging of the master's hand on the desk, represents the pulse in an actual computer which causes all the digits to move along one when each step of the operation is completed. And the answer, 61, in register C. Now the same sum again. Register A, holding the binary equivalent of 38. Register B, holding the binary equivalent of 23. These two rows of boys to the master's left are the numbers to be added. 
two boys at the far end of each row are at the business end where the calculating is done. As each pair of digits reaches the far end, its sum is computed by boys representing the adder. The sum is then fed step by step into the front row of six boys until the addition is complete. And the answer? 61. The computer completes each step in the adding process in a fraction of a second. The flickering digits on the oscilloscope represent the same binary code as the boys' arms in the classroom. The boys have written a number of programs for the computer. One program tests the speed of your reactions. When the note changes, you press a button. Being tested here, the physics master who supervises the project but believes in allowing the boys to do almost everything for themselves. The reaction is measured to an accuracy of one thousandth of a second. The boys haven't yet got round to training the computer to play chess, but already it's very good at one of the simpler games. Well, to play noughts and crosses, you make your moves on the keyboard, which has the numbers one to nine, in, well, what is roughly a noughts and crosses grid. Numbers are printed out at the beginning of the game, in the grid, so you know where they are. You then type where you want to go, and then the computer makes it move, its move, and prints out both your, net, your move and its move at the same time. Your cross is, the computer is naught. If you go on top of one of its places, it'll print out, cheat, I have won. If you go on top of one of your own ones, one of your previous moves, it'll print out full, and then go on to take a move of its own. If it wins, it'll print out, I have won. If you win, which is impossible, you can't possibly, but it will print out, you have won if you did. It'll print out a draw if it can't go at all, because everything's full up. Nelly was built before the more sophisticated modern computer languages were devised, so one of the boys has written a language simple enough for Nelly to cope with. Well, I devised Minigol so that first years and second years, who found it difficult and you'd expect them to, to learn machine code programming, could program things much more easily. And already second formers are using this language to write programs to solve mathematical problems which have been set for them in class. Problems they would have taken much longer to do without the computer. Number 16. Junior boys also lend a hand with maintaining the computer. Being now rather old and not as tough as a new computer, Nelly takes unkindly to starting up and shutting down a couple of times a day. Diodes are particularly liable to failure, and it's the first former's job to test them. Finally, a program that enables the boys to write tunes and have them performed by Nelly. The boys have calculated that Nelly fails on average once in every 12 hours of running time. When this happens, they go into their breakdown routine. HT gone off. Thermostats. Check thermostats, please, Peter. Line failure. Can you check? Coping with faults like this one gives the boys a fundamental lesson in electronics. Okay. Now, uh, what number is it, please? Four. Peter, you change line four, please. System center one. Most adults still find computers a bit of a mystery, but for youngsters like these, brought up in a world of diodes and transistors, there's nothing mysterious about a computer.
Early morning, semi-detached Highgate, London. Industrial consultant Rex Malik feels the business world's pulse from his bedside. Stock prices and market trends are available to him through Europe's first home computer terminal. This terminal is linked to a giant brain 10 miles away in the heart of London. It's one of two Malik has installed for experimental purposes because he wants to know if they can run his life and his home for him. They're simple to operate and experts predict that in 20 years time all new houses will be built with special computer points and the terminals will be cheaper to rent than today's telephones. There's no complicated language to master before he can understand what the computer's saying. The unseen brain sends its messages in good old-fashioned English. Every day the computer sends Rex Malik a daily reminder of where he should be, for he's stored his day-to-day -day diary with the brain. The computer can handle a year's shopping list for the home, final demands, and the exact state of Malik's bank balance. could become a sort of robot housekeeper crossed with a private secretary. But so far, the Malik family isn't quite sure exactly how best to use it. But there's one member of the household who has no doubt of the advantages a computer in the home offers. He's Nicholas Malik, aged four. Every afternoon, he spends time on the terminal. Mr. Malik says that it's helped Nicholas to read and count. Within three days of starting, Nicholas was able to send simple requests to the computer and read the answers as they came back. P, now where's the E? You had it just now. That's him. Okay, now put in four. Okay, now type me in a four again. Give me a four. Four. Push that down. Push the plus. Okay, type me in four more. That's him. That one? Yep, push that one. Let's see if you've done it right. Press my return button. That one? No, that button. You know the return that button. One? Yes. It's an expensive way to do sums, at least £30 per week a terminal. But Rex Malik sees a future world where children could be virtually educated by computer, where every home will have its own terminal plugged into a central brain. And from the brain will come not only school lessons. He sees his son growing up in a world where eventually his very thoughts could be stored and perhaps assessed for his future use. No, no. Now you know where the P is on that keyboard. Come down, come down a bit. The shorthand typist is expected to manipulate reams of paper and prepare them for dispatch. The repetition is tedious and apparently endless. Yet concentration and dexterity are not enough. She's also expected to perform the most delicate tasks. Some people are saying the volume of paperwork is growing so much that very soon there won't be enough shorthand typists to cope. They may be helped in tomorrow's world by something more efficient, if less elegant. With this machine, all you do is feed in a roll of bank paper. From that moment, the machine takes over. It can print invoices, letters, circulars, and documents of all kinds, and insert them in an envelope. The information is programmed in the form of punch cards, which inform the processing unit of the job it has to do. All the calculations are processed and then printed, almost simultaneously, at the rate of nearly 600 lines a minute. The printed documents are fed continuously from the computer printer to the handling machine, which completes a continuous process previously done as separate manual operations by several people. brushes stretch the paper so that the three sheets can be separated without undue slackness. The carbons are extracted almost simultaneously with the separation of the sheets. And the continuous sheets are guillotined according to size. The size of the sheets and the number of lines on each sheet can be programmed to vary with requirements. The documents are folded so quickly that you can hardly see it being done.
The piles of envelopes are fed continuously into the machine, and as they are fed, one by one, the flaps are opened so that they're ready to receive the enclosure. The documents are then inserted into envelopes so that the address is in the window of the envelope. The flap of the envelope is moistened and sealed, and the finished product leaves the machine as a stack of completed documents in addressed envelopes. Tomorrow's office will be an efficient place to work in, but there'll be many who will regret the passing of today's. This is one of the first mechanical design engineers in Britain to have a digital computer built into his drawing board. The designer lines up his drawing exactly for the computer. He's at the stage of creating the detailed drawings for all the parts of the layout, a job often done by a team of as many as six detailed draftsmen. The computer program includes details of all the features that recur frequently in an engineering design, like holes or slots, and these can be automatically added to the plans and positioned exactly. The keyboard gives access to a library of lines, arcs, angles, dimensions and tolerances. All the information for the detailed drawings is turned into numbers and ends up as yards of punch paper tape. Here it's fed into the computer, which produces microfilms of all the required drawings. And that's all you get until you enlarge the microfilm photographically. This technique is already in operation, but the research team is now working on plans for the computer to take over an even greater share of the work. The next stage is to provide the designer with a display screen like this, so that he can actually see his plans as they're keyed into the computer. And then you wouldn't have to wait for microfilm to be processed to see what you've done. It would also mean that you could check on the accuracy of the drawing. A hole is called up, followed by three holes on a pitch circle diameter, then two slots. Then all the dimension lines, which are also stored as standard shapes, and so on, until the drawing is complete. As soon as the designer has finished a detailed drawing, it's given a code number and will be automatically filed in the computer's magnetic store, as well as being produced on microfilm. Then any drawing could be retrieved and displayed should modifications be necessary. Using a light pen, it would be simple to erase any part of the drawing and modify it. Here, a corner is changed to a radius. But more than that, soon one designer alone could produce punch tape that would actually operate a machine tool automatically on the factory floor. And it's this, the numerical control tape, that would turn out the finished part shown on the original detailed drawing. Already, one designer working with a computer has been able to produce all his detailed drawings quickly, accurately, and without the help of any other draftsman. Very soon, perhaps within a year, the designer will be the only worker necessary between the original drawing and the final product.